This is day one of reading Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants what must happen soon. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who gives witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ by reporting what he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud, and blessed are those who listen to this prophetic message and heed what is written in it, for the appointed time is near. John, to the seven churches in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, who has made us into a kingdom, priests for his God and Father, to him be glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming amid the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the peoples of the earth will lament him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and the one who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother, who share with you the distress, the kingdom, and the endurance we have in Jesus, found myself on the island called Patmos, because I proclaimed God's word and gave testimony to Jesus. I was caught up in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a voice as loud as a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then I turned and saw whose voice it was that spoke to me, and when I turned I saw seven gold lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man, wearing an ankle-length robe with a gold sash around his chest. The hair of his head was as white as white wool or as snow, and his eyes were like a fiery flame. His feet were like polished brass refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing water. In his right hand he held seven stars. A sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth, and his face shone like the sun at its brightest. When I caught sight of him, I fell down at his feet as though dead. He touched me with his right hand and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the one who lives. Once I was dead, and now I am alive forever and ever. I hold the keys to death and the netherworld. Write down, therefore, what you have seen and what is happening and what will happen afterwards. This is the secret meaning of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. The portion of Revelation that I read today is called the prologue, so it's the introduction to the book. This seems like as good a time as any to say a few things about what we know about Revelation, to introduce it as a, a literary work and how it has been used and perhaps misused. To begin with, we should say that there's a, a lot about it that we don't know. For example, we don't know who wrote it. It's attributed to John the Evangelist, commonly, uh, but it could have been another John, it could have been another person using that name. I, a few scholars think that it was a committee, that it was a group of people who were responding to the conditions they found around them. That speaks a little to when we think it was written. It appears to have been written about 60 years after the life of Jesus, in a time when the church was, in fact, being persecuted. So, and that may say something about the why. It may well be that it was written as a way of responding to conditions that the writer saw happening in the world, happening to the church and in the church, as a way of giving encouragement to others and trying to explain what was happening in spiritual terms. As for what it is, it is a genre of literature called apocalyptic. We find this elsewhere in the Bible, in Ezekiel and Daniel, and in some of the sayings of Jesus. The basic idea of apocalyptic is that it's speaking about things that are going to happen in the future. And so it's, it's not exactly prophecy, although it's partly prophecy. It is also, however, prediction. 
talking about what God will fulfill in God's time, even if it doesn't seem to be happening in the present moment. Certainly, Revelation has a very complex, complex and complicated history. In its early centuries, it was not considered to be part of the Bible. A number of Christian groups, as they began to assemble what books they thought were going to be part of the Bible they read routinely in church, did not include Revelation. It didn't come into our tradition until the 6th or 7th century, and in some cases it was late as the 1200s before churches began using it. Right down to this day, it is not read in church in the Eastern Orthodox Church. It's considered to be part of the Bible, but is not used for liturgical purposes. And this reflects, in a way, the mixed feelings people have had about it. A good example of that is Martin Luther, who early in his career said that it was neither prophetic nor canonical. He didn't think it was worth reading. He didn't think it was properly a part of the Bible, although later in his career he changed his mind and wrote about it much more favorably. And certainly there have been other Christian thinkers, writers, and leaders through the centuries who have been very suspicious of it and have been wary of using it, partly for the way it may be misused. We certainly can see that in modern times when there are some people in the Christian movement in our own day who would like to use Revelation as a way of both explaining what's going on in the world and as a way of justifying certain decisions that they make about their behavior, the causes they support, the way that they approach politics and social organizing and so forth, uh, because they see what they're doing either as lining up with what Revelation says is supposed to be happening or because perhaps even they think they might be able to force God's hand just a little bit and precipitate the events that are foretold in Revelation. So we approach it with a whole lot of baggage. We all know something about it. Many of us probably have never read it. Some have read it, but have dismissed it as being ravings and only fodder for extreme versions of Christianity that don't seem to align well with the way we understand society and the nature and purposes of God. Every interpretation has to be taken in context. It's impossible now to say that the people who were interpreting Revelation in a particular way a thousand years ago were wrong or right, just as it's impossible now to say that anyone is wrong or right. A lot of it depends on how we understand the context and what we understand the book to be for. A common way of understanding what the book might be for is to distinguish between whether it's a code or a lens. There are those who imagine that it's kind of like the Da Vinci Code. Hidden in it is wisdom that will tell us how we can interpret the signs in our current times, how we can predict what God is going to do, how we can be prepared for it, how we can be better positioned to be on the side of the angels, so to speak, when the actions of God become apparent. On the other side, and the view that I would much prefer to, to take, I think, is that it's a lens. It's a way of viewing the world, viewing what happens as far as what God desires, what is versus what should be. And so to imagine how it is that God envisions the perfection of everything and perhaps how far we are from it. That still may lead us to action but perhaps with a different motivation and with different uh, goals in mind. Clearly, much of it should not be taken literally. I will say that again. Much of it should not and cannot be taken literally. It is meant to be symbolic. And so we are misguided if we try to approach it and imagine that there literally is a, a dragon with seven heads or seven angels throwing down seven bowls of incense or whatever the symbol may be. In all cases, we have to try to decode what it is that the author intended and try to see what the spiritual meaning is in that intention, uh, which may be well beneath the level of the symbols, which in some cases are very disturbing. It's worth saying right up front, parts of it are hard to read, parts of it are hard to imagine, and so it's all the more important that we understand that it has some meaning other than what we find on the surface. I'm compelled to say that if every other interpreter has approached Revelation with a particular agenda, I'm doing the same. I'm no different. 
my lens through which I choose to view it this time is God's economy, our theme for stewardship this fall. You may know that economy comes from the Greek word ekonomia, which means something combination of house and manage. So it's something about how God's house should be run and how revelation might be an image for us of what the household of God is supposed to look like. So that's going to be what I come back to again and again as my framing device. Where do we find messages coming to us about the way that God's household is arranged, organized, and how it should be run? This first section opens with considerable authority. The author wants us to know that this revelation has come to him, not just out of the air, not from some fantasy he had, but is coming directly to him in a message from Jesus. And so Jesus is present. We see them in, in conversation. This is really important for the rest because, again, much of it is so strange to us that we have to know that underneath it all, behind it all, above it all, flowing through it all, is meant to be the gospel, the messages that Jesus preached in his earthly ministry that are supposed to guide all Christians in their lives. One thing I'll point out that we notice even right here in this opening section is going to be the theme of seven. This will come up again and again and again through the rest of the book. It's worth remembering that Seven has some spiritual meaning. It appears many times in the Bible. It has usually some association with completion or with perfection. In fact, the Hebrew word for seven is related in linguistic terms to the word that means to be full or to be complete, to have no emptiness. And so we should be looking for seven again and again as being a sign of the completeness of God that God has finished something. Remember that God rested on the seventh day after creating the universe in six days. So there's something here that's meant to tell us about the completeness, the fullness, uh, the, the bounty of God that is being delivered to us even in strange ways and in strange times. And so with that, I will stop for today. Hereafter, we begin to read what it is that the writer of Revelation wants the churches to hear and so wants us to hear.